Greetings and welcome to The Dividing Line. Welcome back to the big studio today. We're going we're gonna to try to sneak this one in, even though there's something going on elsewhere in the building that might create some background noise. We'll see. Uh, we'll see. Got to roll with the punches, as they, as they say. Before we get into the main uh, subject today, which will involve the use of the big board and some <clears throat> church history uh, discussions and hermeneutics and all sorts of fun stuff like that. Um, there is something that has certainly caught my attention. I uh, have been hearing about it for a while, but um, really am focused upon it now uh, because it is happening um, right now. But the World Health Organization is pushing for a pandemic treaty. And I heard about this. I well, I've heard about the movement toward this kind of thing, a, a global uh, authority to handle pandemics in the future. But you need to understand that a treaty um, overrides constitutional authority in the United States. And so if the crazed uh, leftist communist morons in charge in Washington. That's the only way to describe them. I mean, every time I listen to the leadership of our government today speaking, I just go, how are we even still functioning? I don't understand. You, you listen to uh, our, our new spokesperson, um, who is an advertisement for sexual depravity. And uh, again, the vice president, the president, they are all experts at word salads. What they say makes no sense. And yet everyone just sits back politely and goes, oh, isn't that beautiful? Isn't that wonderful? It doesn't, it's, it doesn't mean anything. Um, but anyway, um, these, these people would sign away our sovereignty in a second. And so I just want you to think about what it would be like if we lived in a world where some elitist in Belgium someplace um, who is, uh, you know, living high on the hog, uh, has control over whether your three-year-old has to have experimental uh, drugs inserted into their body uh, with the force of law. And if you want to see what that looks like, just go online and start watching everything happening in China. Because that's what these people want for us. They want people in hazmat suits running around through our neighborhoods um, locking us in, in jails and uh, feeding us, obviously not enough. I mean, there are people literally jumping out of high-rise buildings in China, uh, committing suicide just to get out of these places. Um, this is what these people want. Th th that China is their, oh, isn't that beautiful? Isn't that wonderful? That's, that's what they think is just so awesome. And uh, obviously, here in the United States, there would be blood in the streets if that were to happen. There's no question about it. Um, but we don't want that. And so we have to be uh, very awake. Unfortunately, uh, that's a uh, issue for the Senate. Uh, both of the senators from my state uh, last week demonstrated themselves to be uh, people without moral fiber uh, in voting for the establishment of unlimited abortion rights uh, up to the point of birth and um, so I get the feeling they would, would be you know, just fine with some of that stuff too, though one of the two of them is very strange on every way that you can be strange. <laughs> She's something else. But anyway, um, be aware of this, be praying about it, be, be looking for it, uh, be talking about it. Um, we, we need, there, there are a few things that we've needed to be more clear about. I mean, this is, this is, one of the things in the United States that has been a blessing is that we still have some shred of constitutional and federal authority left. Um, this would do away with all of it and would hand our sovereignty over to unelected, unaccountable. Basically, it would make Bill Gates the king of the world because he has all the influence of WHO. So this is literally Bill Gates's attempt to take over the world. <laughs> and you go, no. And I go, yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, 
all the rest of this stuff has been preparatory. And here's, here's old Bill, uh, who's buying up all of our farmland and uh, doing all the rest of this kind of stuff, um, literally making a play to be, to be he doesn't need a Titanic. Uh, he can be king of the world uh, from wherever it is he is right now. And uh, so it is uh, very concerning and uh, we need to be uh, very active in uh, den denouncing those who would seek to become uh, techno tyrants over us because that's what these people are seeking to do. So uh, be, very, be watching for information on the World Health Organization, WHO, um, and the Pandemic Treaty uh, because that is the play. That is, that's where they're going. Uh, that may be one of the reasons for a lot of the other stuff going on, just to distract everybody so you're not even paying attention to it. You got, you got let's talk about Ukraine. Uh, let's, let's talk about this. Let's talk, talk about that. Um, one other thing, though, like I said, our primary topic today is far removed from all of these things. The, uh, whenever uh, the Lord lifts his hand of restraint and we see the depth of the evil in the heart of man, as we saw in the mass shooting uh, over the weekend, as we saw a year earlier when uh, a man drove his vehicle through a Christmas parade. Um, neither, those two, those two were not treated the same way, but they are, they're the exact same thing. They're not treated the same way in our world today because there are certain people who can't be evil on a, on a, on a certain level. Um, when we see these things, we are truly reminded of how regular the extension of God's grace toward all of us is. Um, because that kind of thing could happen all the time if God were not restraining pe people from doing it. And what's really interesting is I, I think, and it's a, it's a challenging area, and it's, it's, it's easy to jump off the, the cliff into weird stuff, but uh, the, the relationship between uh, pharmaceuticals, drugs, and the occult, and demons, um, is biblically fascinating. They're frequently associated, they're close, associated with one another. And uh, most Christians today just won't even use terminology like demons. And yet when you see a young man, in this case 18 years of age, recent high school graduate, um, who at that early age is, is turned over to that kind of hatred. And, and again, this has nothing to do with race. I know, I know right now in our country, it it's only has to do with whites. So only whites do this. Far more blacks will be killed by blacks in Chicago this summer by multitude of factors um, than were killed in that shooting, but no one will care. And no one is even allowed to say that. It's all, again, it all goes back to the spiritual realm. It's demonic. I mean, what's, what's the primary push? What's the primary thing that causes uh, murders in Chicago? Drugs, gangs, drugs, and how do gangs get money? Drugs. And of course, the current regime is allowing drugs to just flow over the southern border along with people, uh, millions of them, uh, because they want to change the voting demographic in the United States, and it's evil, and it's traitorous, it's treasonous. Um, and they don't care how many people die. As a result, the, the regime has no concern about human life whatsoever and knows that their policy is a result in this, but they do it anyway. But the point is, these are spiritual things, and uh, a lot of us are afraid to even point out when you, when you withdraw a hand of restraint, you're opening up a vacuum for other things to come in, and those things will always destroy human life. And we see this happening around us. We see it happening in our major cities. It's, it's astonishing. Um, I, when, I just, when I just think of how much my own city has changed in the past 10 years, and the acceleration recently, because we have a mayor that uh, is part of the World Economic Forum stuff, and hence is a part of a traitorous uh, 
movement to destroy the Constitution of the United States and our lives. And I, I can see it practically. I can absolutely see it practically. How? <laughs> I used to be able to get up. I remember back uh, when I was first studying uh, Islam. Uh, I would, this is back when I could get up real early in the morning too. <laughs> so I've seen the decline of Phoenix and it seems to be going along with the decline of shame um, as age just uh, hits you every which way. Anyway, um, I used to be able to get up in the morning. I remember one morning, I wanted to get a particular, I wanted to get a particular portion. I think it was all, I wanted to get a Surah 112 memorized in Arabic. Okay. And so I had it all set up to be able to hear it, uh, listen to it while I was writing. And so before sunrise, I could go out and I could go out onto the Arizona Canal and I could ride on the Arizona Canal and we could, you could, they really neat. You could, I could do an almost 70 mile loop and only cross one street because they had put uh, underpasses in uh, every place else. And it's really, really wonderful. That was 12, 14 years ago. I can't do that now. The underpasses are not passable any longer. They are fundamentally, um, I, I would not call them homeless shelters. Uh, they are drug houses. They reek to high heaven because they use the storm drains as sewers. Uh, they're dangerous. Um, I remember a number of years ago, one of the guys was going through cleaning you know, for the city. They don't bother with that anymore. Uh, the cops don't bother with it anymore. They don't clean it anymore. Um, and he said he had found, I think in that one underpass, when I stopped to talk to him on a bike ride, uh, he had found eight needles in that one underpass that one day. So they're just, they're just not safe. Um, even though they have lights on, um, they just take them over. And there's dogs and, and everything down there. And now, they've, now they're moving out of those to where you're getting tent cities. And, and so I, I can't. The very places that I was riding, and I didn't even have to give it a thought back then. Just, you know, riding along, and, you know, I've got a real good light and stuff like that, and you can't go those places anymore. Um, if I want to ride from my house out of the city, I get to play with the cars now. And at my age, I don't like playing with cars as much as I used to. Uh, I think back in my 30s, some of the stuff that I would do, some of the times I would ride, <laughs> And I look at that now and go, mm, yeah, no, I don't think so. Um, I, I'd, like to, I'd like to see my grandkids get married. And uh, so I've got different priorities now. So things have changed. And it's been purposeful. It's absolutely purposeful all the way along. And uh, we pray uh, for repentance and reformation uh, in, our, in our land. Now, uh, so keep that in mind, World Health, Health Organization Treaty, uh, Pandemic Treaty, bad tyranny, end of, uh, well, it's end of sovereign nations. I mean, that's just, that you won't have sovereign nations anymore. You will have one global government run by unelected people. Uh, and frequently, you won't even know who they are, where they live, what their background is, and how they got that power, other than Bill Gates. <laughs> you, will, you will know exactly how he did that. And uh, you will remember, like I do, how many blue screens of death um, you had to suffer through for that man to become king of the world. Okay, let's switch over to something of vital, well, this, that was of vital importance. This is of vital importance in a very, very different area. Um, we struggle, honestly, uh, in the church often to place ourselves within the proper context of church history. Where, where, where are we? And it, we have... We have joked more than once that, uh, that church history for, for most people starts with Billy Graham. And honestly, as I get older, I'm starting to wonder how many people hear me say Billy Graham. They go, who? And I'm not even sure. Um, and so we, we tend to, to see ourselves within a very, very short context. And so when people start talking about church history, it's very easy to be misled and misdirected uh, as to exactly what's, what's going on and exactly what's being said. 
And so um, unless, unless Rich tells me that, uh, that we're just not going to be able to do the program today because we are hearing large amounts of sound coming into the room right now, as, as long as, I, I can't even, how would you even know? You don't have, you know, you, you know, if you... If, you realize how loud G3 was when you did that show? Well, that's true. You just talked over it? Yeah, we just talked over it. We'll just... If you if you hear stuff in the background, um, don't worry about it. Uh, there's nothing there is nothing we can do about it. Pay and, no attention uh, to that noise behind the curtain. Yeah, that's that's exactly how we're going to have to handle it. Pay no attention to the noise behind the curtain. Um, when we th when we think about church history, um, the, the the problem normally when we when we look at church history, we let, let's let's put the cross right here, okay? And so here's here's church history, and let's let's go over here and. Uh, here's here's where we are today, and the, if you've ever well, that was a really bad line, wasn't it? Yeah. Anyway, um, if you've if you've ever looked at um, books that try to uh, provide a kind of it, it gets really complicated really quickly because you have so many things, so many areas of development and and change and and it and if this is church history, well, world history is going on. And so the history of the church in a particular nation or in a particular area is going to look very different than history in, you know, history in the church in England or what we would call England today, a very, very, very different line than what we would see in regards to China or regards to North Africa. And yet there would also be uh, links between them. And so, you know, you've got the Roman Empire in there, and then you've got the fall of the Western half, the Roman Empire. And then, well, what happens with, you know, Byzantium? And, and, and then you've got the rise of Islam, and, and you've got technological changes going on here. It, it's just incredibly uh, complicated, so much so that a lot of folks just don't even want to necessarily put out the effort to, to look at it. But from a theological perspective, we have to look at this because we have the promise, the one there on the cross said, I will build my church. And so whatever we do with this here, Christ has been active in building his church. Now, you're raised in a fundamentalist context. Um, it's sort of, <laughs> fundamentalism sort of, sort of does this, and then it picks up there. <laughs> and there's just, there wasn't really... Oh, come on, there's at least an extra... Uh, well, and, well but, but actually what the, fun, and, and what the fundamentalists, is, they, they've got a... And then, and then... And you, know, you got the Waldensians down here. And, and these are the, the real Baptists, but they're all hidden. <laughs> you know, it's the trail of blood stuff, which we've, we've talked about before, and, and it's, it's just all... Um, so we, we, can't, we can't go there. That's, that's just simply wrong. Um, and so we have to deal with the reality that, that there has been a work of God, a work of, well, the triune work of God, in building the church. And hence we have to ask ourselves the question, what, what does the church look like in these ages? And... If you take the time to read the writings of those who've lived before us, so remember, 99% of the, of the people that have been a part of this, we don't know their names. We don't have anything they ever wrote. Um, we have buildings they built. And a lot of those buildings, man, they, they, some of them would take 200 years to build. And so generations would build. them. Um, but we don't know the vast majority of these people. And we don't have anything written by them that we, are, that we would be able to, uh, to look at and to, and to understand. And so we have the writings of leaders. And then once in a while, <laughs> I remember one of them. It was obviously one of Mr. Professor's favorite stories uh, back in 1987 or whatever it was. Uh, yeah, it was about 87. Um, and, and that was... Uh, <laughs> Oops. Uh, there was a story about it, it somehow ended up in a 
I think it was in a biblical manuscript. I forget how it was, how it was preserved, but it was from the medieval period, and it was from a monastery, and it was someone complaining that someone up in the choir, so the choir would frequently not be up front, it would be behind you, which is really good for acoustics, by the way. Um, and it also helps to, you not to be distracted by them. You're still looking toward the front, and uh, in, that, in that context would be the altar. Um, but it was, it was a complaint that there was someone in the choir that kept, because if I think this was during night vigils, during the, the night prayers, and so you, you had to have candles. There's no electricity. And someone in the choir was dripping wax from their candles on the people down below them. <laughs> and no one could figure out who it was, you know. So there's, there's someone who sort of snuck into church history a little bit. We don't know who it was. Maybe we'll find out someday. I don't know. Um, but anyway, uh, the point is that we, we, are, we, we do have the ability to sort of look at little snippets of, of time. And when we do so, we recognize that it doesn't matter whether you are Roman Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, any of the various forms of the Protestant churches. Uh, we are all different today than they were back then. Now, some of them, you know, if you're Eastern Orthodox, you pride yourself on looking and believing just like they did in the 7th and 8th century. Uh, that's, that's part of your thing. <laughs> that's part of what makes you who you are. Uh, and you literally do pride yourself on that. Um, <clears throat> but at the same time, you, even amongst the Orthodox, are, are arguing about things today that they were not arguing about back then. And you're using methodologies, and, and you, you get to church in a different way, and things have changed. Um, and, but then, you know, that's the one side. And on the other side, amongst Protestants, you don't even... I don't even care what somebody in the third century was doing or why they worshiped the way that they worshiped or, you know, anything like that. And so you have differences in our perspectives at, at, at that point as well. And so today, you know, let's, let's say that this here is, um, here's the Reformation, okay? Here's the Reformation. Now, Again, from the Eastern perspective, they don't care. <laughs> I mean, it's just, that's something you all were doing, and, um, and we didn't need to worry about that. But in most English-speaking places today, that's still a rather important uh, aspect of things. And so, if we are heirs of the Reformation, there are certain beliefs that are central to us, <laughs> frequently uh, put in the form of the solas, even though that's not historically how they themselves did. We look back and we go, okay, the, the material principle of the Reformation, sola fide, justification by faith alone. The formal principle that gave form, sola scriptura. Scripture is the sole infallible rule of faith of the church. Uh, over against the Roman Catholic theory of sacred tradition and uh, oral tradition and written tradition and and uh, the, the papacy and, and the things that go along with that. And so we, we look at this and, and we, we believe that there is a, a great increase in light uh, post tenebrous looks, after the darkness light, right? A great increase in light after the Reformation. But why would there need to be a need for an increase in light? Well, because the idea would be that along in here, there is a, a diminishment from the apostolic period, a diminishment of light that led to darkness. And this has been a standard understanding uh, of Reformed uh, historians and scholars and things like that. Um, but and what that frequently results in is that we don't really care much about what's in here. Who cares? I mean, is a period of darkness. You've got indulgences being sold. 
um, you know, uh, Rome has fallen uh, back about here or so. And so in the West, you know, you've got the Carolingian dynasty and, and you, you've got some periods where there's important alcumen and, and preservation of manuscripts and things that helped maintain culture in what we call Europe today. So you do have stuff going on in here that's important. And of course, about right here or so, you'd have uh, Thomas Aquinas. So let's, let's put good old T.A. in there because he seems to be uh, so vitally important today. Um, and so, but, but, but we, we're not really sure what all this looks like. And the, the tendency is to say, yeah, you have, and so there is obviously a tremendous amount of nominalism today uh, in, in many nations. There's nominal uh, Islam, there's, there's nominal Buddhism, uh, there's nominal Christianity, obviously. And you look at a lot of uh, Roman Catholic nations today, and you have a tremendous amount, not only of nominalism, but you also have a tremendous amount of uh, just superstition. Uh, in your Central American countries. Uh, it's just so obvious that Roman Catholicism came in and just co-opted all the local gods, in essence, and turned the saints into gods. And uh, you have mixtures of, uh, in the Caribbean, you have all sorts of weird mixtures of, of um, pagan magic and, and uh, Catholicism and stuff like that. Um, and so... We sort of look at that and we sort of figure that's going, going on back here. But what we frequently don't recognize is that you can have, you know, when we look at this, let, let's say the Council of Nicaea is about here. So there's Nicaea. And uh, so Rome falls about here. And so this is, this is your uh, medieval period. We'll just call it MD for now. <laughs> That's, that, wouldn't, that wouldn't do it either. It's MP, medieval period. Um, and this is where this ends. Because uh, you, can, you, can you can break this up. You, you, you've got the Renaissance period right here, um, where you start having universities. You actually got universities all the way back here, but enough that it really starts impacting things. And the Reformation can't happen without this. There's, it's, it's obvious. Um, and so we see all these things, and we struggle with where were the key, the, the key beliefs of the Reformation who in here is still holding these things? And if and how much mixture of error can you have and still have sufficient truth for the church to exist? Because the reformers were not saying we're founding a new church. The whole point of the Reformation was. No, the, the church is founded back here. We still believe that. But there has been a fundamental departing of the church, and so there needs to be reformation, and needs to be reformation, and the reformation needs to take us back to certain principles. And there certainly was a claim that basically, uh, in essence, uh, if you looked at, uh, you know, sort of like, like this area, they're saying, we're going back to there. Uh, and we're, we're going we're gonna to put, um, we're gonna put uh, Augustine about right there. We're going to, you know, there's, there's somebody that believed what we believe in certain areas, but there's a recognition that, but not in all areas. Um, and so you have a great respect for Augustine, and yet we're not following Augustine slavishly, and we're saying he was wrong about certain things. Uh, is he the last light? 
No. No. Uh, you've got Gottschalk in here. Um, you have, in fact, I, I, I wanted to read you a, a portion here of something. Um, you have a man by the name of Fulgentius. And if you're not familiar with Fulgentius, and most, I would guess 99.5% of our audience uh, is not familiar with Fulgentius, and that is perfectly acceptable. Uh, we don't have to get too upset about that. Uh, but uh, Fulgentius was Bishop of Rusp. And uh, let me pull this up here. Uh, where, did, where did he go? Uh, I hate when stuff just disappears. Oh, there you are. There it is. Sorry. Um, you may have actually heard of Fulgentius. I, I quoted him in a debate that I did in London a number of years ago on the Marian dogmas. Um, his years are 467 to 532. So into the early 6th century. So the end of the 5th, early 6th century. Listen to what Fulgentius says uh, about the issue of Mary. This is the grace whereby it came to pass that God, who came to take away sins, because sin was not in him, was conceived and born a man in the similitude of sinful flesh. The flesh of Mary, forsooth, which had been conceived in iniquities after the manner of men. Repeat that again. The flesh of Mary, which had been conceived in iniquities after the manner of men, was indeed sinful flesh, which bore the Son of God in the similitude of sinful flesh. We must believe that the only begotten God did not derive the defilement of sin from the mortal flesh of the virgin. Truly, therefore, Mary conceived God the word which she bore in sinful flesh, which God received. Now, you can see the immediate relevance of this. You have a bishop, um, literally half a millennium after the events of the crucifixion. So he dies in 532. Um, and you have... Very clearly, he has no concept of later Marian dogmas in regards to uh, Mary, the Immaculate Conception, certainly no, nothing about the bodily assumption, anything like that at all. I also, just in passing, being the weirdo that I am, notice he uses the phrase, only begotten God. I would love to see what the Latin on that is um, and see if that's a reflection of John 1.18. Um, because that's, you know, monogamous theos. It's a textual variant there, very interesting. Um, but he also, uh, elsewhere, listen to this. For this reason, regarding all those whom God wishes to save, we must understand that we do not think anyone can be a saved apart from God who wills it. Further, let us not imagine the will of the omnipotent God either is not fulfilled or is in any way impeded in certain people. For all whom God wishes to save are unquestionably saved, and they cannot be saved unless God wishes them to be saved, and each person whom God does not will to be saved is not saved, since our God, quote, has done all things that he willed, end quote. Therefore, all are saved whom he wishes to be saved, for this salvation is not born of the human will, but is supplied by God's good will. Nevertheless, these all men whom God wishes to save include not the entire human race altogether, but rather the totality of those who are to be saved. So the word all is mentioned because the divine kindness saves all kinds from among all men, that is, from every race, status, and age, from every language and every region. Sound familiar? Yeah. That's how Reformed people address those key passages as well. And this is a bishop of what would be called the Catholic Church um, halfway into the first millennium. And I could give you all sorts of quotations from Fulgentius uh, promoting what we would call sola scriptura. Now, does that mean that Fulgentius was a Reformed Baptist? <laughs> no, it does not. And that is an abuse of church history to even try to anachronistically read categories 
that we have today back into the early church. This is one of the reasons that uh, when I when I listen to, when I bother to waste the time in listening to Roman Catholic apologists trying to deal with, with church history, it, it, it's diffi- it becomes more and more, maybe I'm just not patient uh, anymore, but it becomes more and more difficult for me to listen to these things because it's just such an abuse. We do not have to turn Fulgentius into a, into a Reformed Baptist. They do, obviously. He was a bishop of the church, for crying out loud. Um, and this is, they are told that their beliefs have been what's been believed in every age of the church, and blah, 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 and so they've got to attack him, and he's not the, the tradition of the church, and yan, 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 yan. Um, I, I just tire of the sophistry uh, that marks the vast majority of that kind of stuff. But Fulgentius allows us to, to stop and to think about the fact that the church in every age um, gives to us this challenge. We don't know the true and the false. We, we ask for professions of faith. We do the best that we can. We have to, out of grace, uh, accept the, um, the claims and the, uh, the assertions of people. And sometimes we get taken for a ride. Sometimes we end up with people in our midst who are not truly believers, and we leave that to God. Uh, but that's the case in every, in every age with the church. Uh, that's been her reality from the beginning. What you have is a mixture, and there are times when there is more light, and there are times when there is less light. And it's not our job to try to climb into the hearts of these individuals and determine their salvific status, though for some reason we cannot resist the temptation to do so. We try to do it no matter what. Our goal, really, I think our mindset should, should be to hope for the best for as many as we possibly can. That's, again, not my background. That, that's not a fundamentalist background at all. But it should be, I think, from a New Testament perspective, we should hope for the best in those situations. But you get a mixture of beliefs and consistencies and level of consistencies. And to be honest with you, I would say there were times, you know, just remember, almost every person in this audience right now has a digital device like this now. And on this digital device, you have access to um, <laughs> thank you, Summer. I will try to ask. <laughs> Look, when, you're, when your daughter's uh, carrying, uh, hopefully, your fifth grandchild, a little boy, um, and she asks you to check out the, uh, the homeschooling uh, place next door because she doesn't want to drive halfway across the valley. And I'm going out the East, the East Valley uh, tomorrow anyways. You do what your, what your daughter asks you to do, and uh, you, you help take care of the grandkids. That's, that's how it works. So I will, I'll do my best. Uh, uh, dear to, well, actually, when do they close? I don't know. You don't know? I think 4.35. Oh, so we now have a limitation to how long the program can go, uh, thanks to summer. So uh, if, if any of you want me to go farther, and it's, I, I've just got to have my priorities. Um, so Moses was in the bulrushes, and uh, oh yes, Fulgentius. Okay, so when you think about it, uh, we have on this unit access to more translations of the Bible and information about the Bible than any generation before us has ever had. Do you realize how unusual it is in all of that church history to own, as a Christian, to actually have direct access to the scriptures for yourself at all? I mean, I would say that starts, I mean, that, 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 that obviously is, is a big thing, the Reformation, 
but it, it's really from about here onward. You can have at least a copy of the scriptures as a believing Christian. They become affordable enough to have uh, about at that point. Before then, it's just not possible. It's just not possible. I mean, when you think about that, it's astonishing. And so, is it not understandable that there would be a real mixture of light and darkness, truth and error? And so, with, with that, with that, what I want to ask, what, you know, very, touch on briefly, is the concept of the great tradition. This is the new buzzword, all popular, the great tradition. And we had a, uh, here's, here's, uh, let's see if I can find this here. Um, there was a, see I opened way too many of these things. There it is, there it is. Okay, Dr. Craig Carter, again, doc, Dr. Carter, a brilliant man, Sure, he's a wonderfully nice fellow. And when I was looking through his timeline, it seems he and I agree on a lot of things in regards to the wackiness of what's going on in the world today. So we would probably get along like gangbusters along there. But um, he's one of the major proponents of the great tradition. And he tweeted something last week. Um, on the 14th, and it says, um, to, assur to assume that the current Roman Catholic Church is the same as the historic church that existed prior to the Reformation is a big mistake. As Haken says, the Roman Catholic Church is not the Catholic Church of the first five or six centuries of the patristic era. The Reformed Church is the heir of pre-Reformation Catholic Orthodoxy. Okay. What was confusing about this was, um, okay, the current Roman Catholic Church is not the same as the historic church that existed prior to the Reformation. Okay, prior to the Reformation, when? Because there's a lot of time prior to the Reformation, and there's a lot of development during that time period. And there are big, big, big Monuments of development. Nicaea is big, big change, big change. Um, the uh, you know obviously the peace of the church of three thirteen, and then at the end of that century you have uh, Christianity becoming the not just a religio licita, a legal religion, but now the religion of the state. That happens at the end of you know around three eighty, and so. Uh, that's a completely different time period than the schoolmen, scholasticism, uh, Aquinas. Um, that's a, there's been a lot of development in, that, in, in between those churches. And so, Michael Haken's statement, which I'll read to you in a moment, first five or six centuries of the patristic era. Okay, up through Fulgentius. All right, let's use Fulgentius. He's, he's right at that, at that shift, right? The beginning of the 6th century. Is that different than the Roman church that Luther reacted against? Of course it is. Massively so. But in what ways? Specifically in what way? Um, now that's, that's a fascinating question in and of itself. That's a fascinating question in and of itself. Because the, the argument today is, on the doctrine of God, nothing changed. Well, okay, let me take that back. Nothing fundamentally changed, but there was a continuing development. In fact, Dr. Carter has been one of the people that has said that the doctrine of the Trinity finishes its development in Aquinas in the medieval period. And so there is this concept of a 
continuing development that evidently he considers to be a good, proper, and necessary development from the patristic church all the way through um, the 12th century. That's a long time, a very long time. And I would argue that the specific developments within Aquinas require uh, input from sources that we, need, we just simply need to be extremely concerned about. Uh, and that would include, um, obviously, Aristotle. Now, what's the statement from Michael Hagen? I just realized I'm never going to get through all this. Um, and I have forgotten to mention that we have a special program on Thursday. It will be in here, and we will have numerous guests. I guess I should have mentioned this to you. Um, uh, Cross Politic is in town. And um, speaking Thursday, I will be speaking, I will be part of the panel Thursday evening at their event here locally. And they would very much like to uh, uh, bust in and, um, and say hi. In fact, that was Gabe Wrench that was texting me right there and uh, asking about details about that. And uh, so, um, yeah, we'll, 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 hey, you got two days. You got plenty of time. It's just a matter of finding some place for some of the stuff stored over there. Anyway, um, so yes, we will have a special program on Thursday. And it's, that means I won't be able to continue this subject on Thursday because I don't really think the guys are going to want to be discussing these things. Um, but we will have to continue this because there's all sorts of stuff on hermeneutics that we need to get into uh, as well. And I'm going to have to look at my calendar and see if we can't sneak another one in here because this, this is important stuff and I just, too much stuff going on. Um, here's what Michael Haken had said, so at least let's get the context. Um, he says, I have spent a lifetime of study engaging in resourcement, that is, in the retrieval of the riches of church history for the present day. In my early academic career, that retrieval was centered upon the patristic era. Today, it's mostly the particular Baptists of the long 18th century. One thing that was etched deep into my mental light from that study of the patristic world had to do with the question that I asked from time to time, how could I study the fathers so deeply and not swim the Tiber and become a Roman Catholic? Well, first of all, I had grown up in the pre-Vatican II Roman Church and had seen some of its worst problems then and since. And there is a lot to be said about that. Much more significant was this. The Roman Catholic Church is not the Catholic Church of the first five or six centuries of the patristic era. That's what was being referred to earlier. In fact, I am more and more convinced as a historian that the Roman Church of the present day is mainly a product of the High Middle Ages and the Counter-Reformation, but be that as it may. Now, now, I can't let that be a be as it may. Listen to what's that said. The Roman Church of the present day is mainly a product of the High Middle Ages. What's the High Middle Ages? The Schoolman and Thomas Aquinas. The High Middle Ages and the Counter-Reformation. And yes, Rome was deeply influenced by the Reformation and hence the Counter-Reformation. In other words, if I want to join a church that claim, with claims to antiquity, it would not be present-day Rome. And see, I, I would say all this stuff, I would have said this before Francis came along, but now with Francis, oh good grief, everything has changed completely. Um, what is critical is this, is my faith and that of my church built squarely on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Jesus Christ as the cornerstone. That is the crucial matter. That is what the Spirit of Christ has anointed. So what if I can trace an organic succession of material churches if half of them were theologically askew? What I want is that new mythological line of succession. That is true Catholicity, John 8, 39. Okay, so that, nothing shocking or unusual about that. But it is fascinating to, to think about the modern Roman church as, as the product of the high Middle Ages and the Counter-Reformation, because that throws Aquinas right in the middle of it. And so what we've got going on today is we have people who want to uh, get back to Thomas <clears throat> and get to, back to using Thomas. What they want to do is they want to edit Thomas, and they want to edit the great tradition. And so for them, the great tradition is primarily doctrine of God. Okay, that's 
that's what this great tradition, that's the good part of the great tradition that we can, uh, we can borrow, that we can, come, that we can use. That we need, in fact, we need this. In fact, I heard someone recently say that if, if we don't use the hermeneutical principles that come out of the great tradition, in other words, this is the other area that I don't know I'm going to get to today. I, I, I don't know. Um, but uh, if, we don't, if we continue using modern interpretation rather than pre-modern interpretation, we make, quote, mincemeat, mincemeat out of our confession. Um, and most of that has to do with the doctrine of God, simplicity, uh, inseparable operations, um, the things that uh, Aquinas emphasized. But that's it, because there's so much more to any meaningful understanding of what the great tradition would have been. Well, first of all, how do you even define it? There is no one great tradition. What they're saying is, well, we can, we can trace a particular uh, concept of the doctrine of God that, that we think is very important to continue to hold. But the people who made up the great tradition would not have accepted the idea of the separation out from that of everything else. What about ecclesiology? What about doctrine of baptism? What about the doctrine of infant baptism for regeneration? Um, a Baptist does not hold to major portions of the great tradition. And self-consciously, and to explain why, requires you to be a Okay, I'm only going to show this for a second because it's a bad, bad word. It, 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 this, is, this is really bad. It requires you to be a biblicist. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. It, it, it's, yeah. I, 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 in fact, I have to erase it. It's just, oh, it's just today, there, some of you screamed and, and hid behind somebody else when I, when I wrote that because, oh, it's so bad to be a biblicist now. But if you're a Baptist, in regards to the great tradition, <laughs> that's what you have to do. You, you don't have any choice. That's how we got here. And to turn around and now saw off the, the branch you're sitting on, well, okay. Long ways down, but if you want to do that, that's okay. Uh, so how do you define this thing? What, what is this great tradition? And if you want to boil it down to and say, well, it's just this. And, you know, there are people who've been doing this for a long time. Remember, how, for how many years have I I've been criticizing mere, the, the, the mere Christianity movement? Not mere Christendom. That's something different. The mere Christianity movement where, you know, you know, really the only thing that we can all really get together on is the Trinity and the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And that's, that's enough. Now we're, we're, we're good. And you go, uh, not what the apostles said. In fact, the only place the apostles, I mean, they anathematized people who taught a different what? Gospel. Yeah, but we're never going to agree on that. So ah, let's, we can't go there. What's the gospel of the great tradition? Are you telling me you can actually have a love for the great tradition's doctrine of God, but not the great tradition's doctrine of the gospel? You know, they don't go together? They're, they're somehow separable? <laughs> hmm. That's an interesting way of looking at things, isn't it? Yeah, it's a very, very interesting way of looking at things. Now, <clears throat> let me, um, I was going to, you know, I'll, let me go ahead and mention this just in, because it, it does bear that out. I, I, should have mentioned this just a little bit earlier. Um, this mixture thing. Um, this, is, this is illustrated for us, I think, fairly clearly in the love that the Reformers had for Bernard of Clairvaux. 
Now, Bernard's years are 1090 to 1153. And so he's in that same basic time period. Uh, and it is very clear that uh, many of the reformers, Calvin especially, have a very high view of Bernard of Clairvaux. There's quotations of him. Uh, some of you sing songs based on uh, things that, that Bernard wrote. And what is interesting is when you dig into Bernard, let me see if I can find the quotation here. Uh, where'd it go? Um, yeah, okay. I, I think... Well, where did it... Okay, here it is. For what could humanity, enslaved by sin, held in the devil's strong grip, do of itself to regain the righteousness it had previously lost? Therefore, the one who lacked righteousness, listen to this, had another's righteousness imputed to him. It was humanity that owed the debt. It was humanity that paid it, i.e., in the man Christ Jesus. For as Paul says, if one died for all, then all died, so that the one bore the sin of all, the satisfaction made by one is imputed to all. There's, an, there's a clear imputation of righteousness in his thought. Now, is, is there, does it have... You see, the Reformation... Bring, provides us with the ability to make specific differentiations. It forces us to ask specific questions that we're not being asked at this point in time. And so until you have that, that clarifying lens, there can be an issue. And certainly you're going to be able to find things in Bernard where you go, well, that's not how we would say it today. Okay, but he does give us that, that example of someone not that far before the Reformation, where you would have the Reformers going, yeah, here is, here is a believer. Here is someone, the, 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 God's still building his church. He's still saving his people. But he would be in, he, he, would, he would be supporting things that in later centuries, no, you can't do that. There's been a clarification. There's been, a, there, there's been an, an understanding. But can we look back and say, yeah, but Christ is still building his church, even though you've, you'd have a tremendous amount of nominalism, and many of these men were, were pained by the, the ungodliness of the, of the church around them and, and, and all the things like that. Um, is that not a, an aspect of it, too? And, 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 and the answer would be, yes, it, yes, it would be. Um, but that gives us a, an understanding. This was an article that was sent to me by a dear friend, um, and it's, it's an excellent article uh, that, that goes into Bernard and and some of the things he did. Now, one of the things that I really needed to make sure to get to today that I was going to do at, at the beginning, and Rich and I are sitting here chuckling as we listen to um, what's going on next door. Um, let, me, uh, let me read you um, some, some quotations, okay? Um, I think this is, this is important. Um, quote, on this account, we are bound to avoid them, but to make choice of the things pertaining to the church with the utmost diligence and to lay hold of the tradition of the truth. For how should it be if the apostles themselves had not left us writings? Would it not be necessary in that case to follow the course of the tradition which they handed down to those whom they did co to whom they did commit the churches? And so here is a... A statement that would seem to sound like here very early on this is from Irenaeus against heresies this is 170 to 180 this is in the second century talking about tradition handed down to those to whom they did commit the churches now it's it is said within this context for how should it be if the Apostles themselves had not left us writing well his point is they did but he says some things such as, as I have already observed, the church, having received this preaching and this faith, although scattered throughout the whole world, yet as if occupying but one house, carefully preserves it. 
For although the languages of the world are dissimilar, yet the import of the tradition is one and the same. Sounds like there is an oral tradition that is being passed around the world and that all the churches possess, right? That's what it sounds like. And so when, what we're, we're hearing from people today is that there is a need for tradition. And I've been dealing with this for years because, of course, this is the Roman Catholic argument. But let's leave Rome and its specific arguments out for a moment. We now have people saying, that there are things we need outside of Scripture. And that the term tradition is an acceptable term to use for these things that we need. And here's Irenaeus, and Irenaeus is very, very early on, and Irenaeus is talking about this tradition that exists exists in the churches. Now, the first thing to recognize, I want to make sure we talked a little bit about today, was the fact that we do need to look at, when we look at someone like an Irenaeus, what situation is he in? He is writing very early on. Um, Most of the canon is recognized, but not necessarily uh, universally. This is still during that period of development and recognition of the canon. Um, not development of the can, canon one, but recognition in canon two. And he is one of the leading people in defending the Christian faith against Gnosticism, which <laughs> I was thinking about this earlier today. Uh, we, we use that term all the time today to take shots at people. But the fact of the matter is, if you can't name, uh, if you can't tell me what a demiurge is, and can't name some of the eons, don't talk about Gnosticism, (laughs) okay? It's way too easy to take shots at people when you're actually talking about dualism and it doesn't have anything to do with Gnosticism. Gnosticism was a massive threat to the church, a massive threat to the church. And Irenaeus studied it carefully. For many years, his stuff was almost all we knew about Gnosticism came from Irenaeus until we found the Nag Hammadi libraries, the Oxyrhynchus papyri, and things like that, and found the original writings of the Gnostics, and he did a great job in describing them. He really, really did. And so he's in the middle of a battle, and the Gnostics are claiming apostolic authority. They are, they are claiming the right to interpret the Christian scriptures and to change the Christian scriptures. And so you always have to look at what was the conflict, what was the great battle in that day of that particular individual. And so those were difficult days. Those were, you know, we have 2,000 years to look back on. They had nothing. And so that's that's a massive challenge. There's no two ways about it. But you always have to keep reading. You always have to keep reading. Because what does, does, does Irenaeus ever define for us this tradition, this rule of faith, that you are to have. That's, that's, the, that, that's the really important thing, is when you talk about the rule of faith. Does he ever de- define it for us? He does. Let me read it for you. These have all declared to us that there is one God, creator of heaven and earth, announced by the law and the prophets, and one Christ, the Son of God. If anyone does not agree to these truths, he despises the companions of the Lord, nay more, he despises Christ himself, the Lord. Yea, he despises the Father also, and stands self-condemned, resisting and opposing his own salvation, as is the case with all heretics. And so there is the tradition. There is the tradition. What is it? One God, creator of heaven and earth, announced by the law and the prophets, and one Christ, Son of God. Everything that I read to you, what is it? It is sub-biblical in the sense that it is derived from Scripture. It is not a tradition that is outside of Scripture. It does not contain a revelation that is outside of Scripture that is then necessary for us to then interpret Scripture. The Gnostics didn't start at the right place. They rejected fundamental, and of course they would change. They, you know, Marcion, uh, would, would change the actual scriptures. He'd get rid of the Old Testament. He would, they, the, the Gnostics literally were teaching that 
the God that we would know as Yahweh, uh, was Yaldabaoth, a, a, almost an abortion in a sense, a, 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 a beast that should not have come forth from wisdom, uh, a mistake, a, 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 a foolish God. And so uh, he's not saying that there is revelation that we need to have that's outside of Scripture. All those beliefs, it even says, testify by the Law and the Prophets. You can't even go there uh, unless you recognize that we're, we're talking about stuff that has been derived from Scripture. What he's saying is there is a fundamental basic starting place that Scripture itself provides. And if you reject that, if you re remove the portions of Scripture that teach those things, you're never going to have anything even close to what the apostles themselves taught because the apostles are the ones that gave us these scriptures. Now, the reason I bring this up is uh, what we'll get into the next time we address this. What we'll get into is this concept of pre-modern hermeneutics and exegesis and interpretation. Uh, this is, in my opinion, as I listen to my fellow Reformed Baptists talk about the greatest things that have changed in their understanding over the past 10 years. This is what it is. We have Reformed Baptists today talking about, uh, well, let me just describe this and then we'll, you'll see why we need to go here. Reformed Baptists today basically saying that if your goal in the interpretation of Scripture is to start by knowing what the original author intended to communicate to his original audience. So uh, you, you're reading uh, 1 Corinthians, and so the, the first thing that you want to think about is what was Paul seeking to communicate to the church at Corinth? What, what were the issues that he, that he raises? What were the, the problems that the church is experiencing? Um, and you, you start there, and then you seek to make application. What we're being told now is wrong, wrong, wrong. Don't go there. That's, that's not how you do it. When I hear that, I just go, what on earth has happened? What is going on here? Because I will simply suggest to you, if you don't start there, you've got nothing left. You've got no place to go. Well, we need to, we need to understand that the Bible is a whole. Of course it is. But you don't have a Bible until you start reading the Word. And the only way to discuss what the Bible says is to start with the initial context. You can't start outside of that. You can't, you, you can't say, well... What you need to do is you need to have the dogmas of Nicaea. Really? I thought the authority of the dogmas of Nicaea was their fidelity to Scripture. I've heard people actually saying that the way to interpret the Bible is to do so only within light of the dogmas of Nicaea. Which came first? What comes first? I can assure you, anybody who starts the dogmas of Nicaea has probably never attempted to present this to Muslims <laughs> or to Mormons or to, they're not doing debates, they're not doing apologetics, this, no, uh, they're, they're, they're going in a different direction. But this deeply impacts the, uh, the idea of how we interpret Scripture. Now, unfortunately, what I've heard, and I've heard this more than once, is a very shallow, narrow um, idea that, well, I was taught that all of exegesis is just simply the author's intention, and that's it. That's it. It's like, what? That's where you start. You have to know what the words mean. You have to know lexicography. You have to know grammar. You have to know syntax, because that's how we talk. And when God spoke to Eve, he used all those things and did not require her to go to philosophical school to understand them. Okay? So to say, well, oh, but we can, we can talk about the philosophy of all these things. No, duh. We're well aware of that. That doesn't make those things prior to Scripture in its authority. Because God made us and held us accountable, so that means he made us to understand. Okay, so we can, 
We can take all the stuff apart if we want to. That does not make that prior to and something we can use to fiddle around with the meaning of Scripture itself. But you can't talk about the meaning of Scripture until you start there. You can't do it. And nobody who's, who's saying that it's wrong to start with looking at the Scripture in that way, they all want you to interpret their books that way. <laughs> they want to be interpreted that way. When, if they've written books, they want you to actually understand what they meant to communicate. <laughs> it's, it's funny. You could actually write a book saying that you shouldn't actually be concerned about what Paul, initially, Paul wanted to communicate to the Corinthians uh, in a book where you want to make sure that people are concerned that they're understanding what you're meaning to communicate to them. <laughs> it's, it's, it doesn't make any sense, but that's what people get stuck in. Um, so, so, whenever we get this chance to do this again, because I forgot to tell Rich what was going on, uh, we need to talk about hermeneutics, and we need to talk about the fact that uh, Paul's epistle to the Corinthians, Isaiah's uh, uh, prophecy, Amos's prophecy, even the book of Revelation had a fixed meaning before anyone dreamed this up. Okay? It had a fixed meaning. That does not mean that it is wrong for me upon encountering the text and reading the text to avail myself of the wisdom of others. And so I, I have the ancient commentary on Scripture uh, where I, I've, I've taken the time to look at what people a thousand years ago had said about a particular text of Scripture, and the reality is there are many times I've looked at what they've said, and while, they can, while I could appreciate what they were saying, I had to reject it because they missed what the text itself said. And if you make this your, your filter, you can't do that anymore. They got it right, and if that becomes part of the quote-unquote great tradition, well, what are you supposed to do? Are you going to be unhumble enough to question the great tradition, you see? And Scripture becomes, well, as somebody said, a wax nose that you can just form into whatever you want based upon your interpretation, because we all get to interpret the great tradition. The great tradition. Hmm. I think this is really, really vitally important that we have a balanced hermeneutic. A hermeneutic that... Um, is first and foremost something that will allow the Christian faith to be the Christian faith many generations from now, and not something that is under this external authority that, that filters things out. Um, I, I, I get where some of these writers are coming from, and, and, but they're, it, they're always reacting against uh, modern exegesis that does not allow the Bible to be the Word of God. I believe the Bible is the Word of God, and that is part of your herm hermeneutics. It has to be. We're not just dealing with human words, but you have to start with what the words are before you can discuss their relationship to any other words. And you have to know what Paul was saying before you can relate Paul in Corinthians to Paul in Romans to Luke in Acts to John. In, you have to. To abandon that is to, is to abandon any kind of uh, ability to define the Christian faith in any meaningful fashion at all. And so we will look at hermeneutics and then a fascinating conversation that took place uh, just uh, last week, over the weekend, where someone asked about the Kama Yohanium, the uh, clearly, clearly, unambiguously, unoriginal edition of 1 John 5-7, and posited an inconsistency, described as being odd, uh, that I would appeal to textual data in regards to the subject when I'm holding to sola scriptura. It was one of the most massive confusion of categories. This particular individual confuses categories regularly, um, but other people were picking up on it. And I definitely want to talk about that, because <laughs> that's just... This is basic Christian defense 101. If we can't, if we cannot even go there, uh, we're, and by the way, I, one of the things I do want to do as well, there was an excellent, I, I tweeted it out, but there's an 
awesome article that I ran across uh, that was sent to me um, on the uh, quote unquote confessional bibliology perspective. It just, it's sad to see that movement continuing, but from a historical perspective, it's dead. It's, it's inherent self-contradictory nature is so clear and so doc been so documented, it's, it's amazing. It, but it continues to attract people, and that got connected in with all this as well as we're talking about hermeneutics. So um, anyways, so sorry to have not gotten to everything I wanted to get to today, but um, there's, just, there's just too much. There's so much uh, that, that we need to be thinking about and try to think about consistently with clarity and hopefully helping you to do those particular things. So like I said, on, um, on Thursday, uh, the plan right now is to have the cross politic gang uh, in. Uh, how many of them are there? Mm, four. There's a lot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Well, okay. you, you, you used to say you're good. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, we, we, we may have to put a microphone like one of these out and, you know, in front or, you know, do stuff like that. Yeah, somewhere to wire the thing. Yeah, yeah. Well. <laughs> well. Get to it. Um, so, <laughs> so we're going to have the cross politic gang in, and then uh, tomorrow, uh, Thursday evening, uh, we're all getting together someplace out in Gilbert or someplace like that. I, I don't, I have to look it up before I get there. Uh, so that, that's always an interesting uh, encounter uh, when you get chocolate knocks in here and stuff like that. He's going to be very nervous, I'm sure, coming in here. He's, he's just he's sort of a nervous guy, you know? He, he seems really calm, cool, and collected on the program, but nice. Around me, anyways, he seems to be a nervous guy. So, um, and Rich will, be, Rich, Rich will control the buttons. And, oh, that also means, that means, we need to find a Wurlitzer organ a sound effect somewhere in there just to make him feel at home. Oh. Because uh, he's, he's the one that does, the, does the, the, the organ sound effects and stuff. I don't think he carries those with him. So, anyway. Uh, <laughs> All right, well, th thanks for watching the program today. Uh, like I said, uh, what, it's, it's going to be earlier program on Thursday. We will see you then. Bye-bye.